Of all the dislocations caused by government responses to COVID, arguably none were more disruptive to everyday life than the shutting down of in-person education for the country's 50 million K-12 students and their parents. Teachers unions fought to keep schools online, even as evidence piled up that remote learning was disastrous, especially for poor kids, and as the experiences of other developed countries, which mostly continued to operate in person, demonstrated that schools weren't a major source of infection. The results were easy to predict. Historic declines in reading and math scores. Major school districts continue to alienate parents, with Washington, D.C. recently decreeing that kids ages 12 and older would need to be vaccinated even for remote learning, a measure that would have barred 40% of the city's black teens from getting an education. That policy was thankfully pushed back until January of 2023, but it's still on the books lurking like a bully at the far end of the hallway. More parents than ever have exited major urban school districts and school choice proponents are building on recent policy victories such as Arizona's new law in which money follows the child with up to $7,000 that can be used at any public or private school in the state. The politics of school choice are already a major issue in the midterm elections and will be again in 2024, especially as internal polls conducted by the American Federation of Teachers find for the first time that voters in battleground states are more likely to agree that Republicans are better on education than Democrats. So what happens next? At Freedom Fest, the annual July gathering in Las Vegas, Reason talked with Corey DeAngelis, a senior fellow at the American Federation of Children and a senior fellow at Reason Foundation, which publishes Reason.com. We talked about how COVID has permanently reshaped the education landscape, why top-down bans on critical race theory are ineffective and anti-freedom, why some red states like Texas are terrible on choice, and why all of us, whether we have kids in K-12 schools or not, should be invested in radical reform. Corey DeAngelis, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you so much for having me. So there is a uh, leaked poll that is really kind of talk, you know, that that sheds a weird light and a kind of wonderful light for school choice people on, you know, school choice issues up coming into the uh, midterm elections and beyond. It was it was commissioned by the American Federation for Teachers. Yep. So this was a poll that was supposed to show one of the biggest teachers unions how well they are positioned going into things. What's the poll say and uh, you know, what's the fallout from that? Yeah, it doesn't look good for the teachers unions. It's essentially a, an epic self-owned by Randy Weingarten and her union, the American Federation of Teachers. So this is a poll of likely voters in battleground states like Pennsylvania and others conducted by or for, for the American Federation of Teachers. And the top line finding was that um, likely voters in these battleground states were more likely to support Republicans on education as opposed to Democrats. And so that's that's the big finding itself. Right. Um, usually Republicans are leaning on things like the economy and jobs, right. not so much on education. We did see this happen with Glenn Youngkin when he won the gubernatorial race in Virginia against Terry McAuliffe, who was a, was a, a former incumbent in the state. In a state that went 10 percentage points to Biden, yep. Glenn Youngkin won by two percentage points. And according to Washington Post exit polling, he won with education voters by about six percentage right. points. And education was the number two issue in that election. Yeah, and now that was schools coming, really coming directly out of COVID and lockdowns yep. and just arbitrariness and a, and a broad sense of teachers not caring about education during COVID. They were more, you know, so... Yep. Now, you know, we're, we're, you know, 10 months past all of that kind of stuff. Um, what what are the complaints that parents have about educators right now? So people, parents had their eyes opened wide, wide because of the uh, pandemic school closures, the union induced school closures. They got to see what was going on in the classroom. And the problems, as I see it, are just symptoms of the larger issues that we force millions of families to send their kids to a one-size-fits-all government-run school system that by definition isn't going to work for families who disagree about how they want their kids raised, mm -hmm. how they want their kids to be educated. So whether it's mask mandates or not, whether it's remote versus in-person instruction, whether it's this curriculum or that curriculum right. or anything else, by definition, if families are paying attention to what's going on, there's going to be a large 
segment of the population, or at least a, a sizable uh, par part of the population that's not going to be happy for whatever reason, be just by definition. Yeah. And I want to also point out that this poll also found that uh, Randy Weingarten has been saying that it's been the Republicans stoking, you know, uh, bringing politics into the classroom. But they also asked in their own poll, um, you know, what, what's the biggest issue with public schools? The number one issue was overly politicized classrooms. But then they also asked, is who's more responsible, the Republicans or the Democrats? And by about five to six percentage points, these likely voters were saying it's more likely to be the Democrats that are creating the issues with politics in the classroom as opposed to Republicans. You know, I mean, it, in a weird way, the classroom is always hyper politicized, right? Because, I mean, you know, everybody's anxious about kids. And when you decide on one curriculum versus another, it's not you know, it's not partisan politics, but there's there's an ideology embedded in that, whether it's pedagogical or political or both. Um, is it accurate? Like are American classrooms, K through 12 classrooms, are they more politicized now or are they more ideological than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago? You know, or is that kind of a culture war, you know, fabrication? I mean, it's hard to tell uh, the trend on whether the mm -hmm. classrooms are more or less political. Right. I think it's more so families are can see what's going on in the classroom, and because of the remote instruction, yeah, this they, was they the, kind of. I, I, you know, the schools didn't realize like when kids were learning at home on the kitchen table or in the living room, and parents finally saw what was going on. They're just like, "What? What am mm -hmm. I paying for?" Yeah, and so I think a lot of families just thought that the schools were focusing on the basics, just mm -hmm. math, reading, and writing. And then they started to see things that they disagreed with in the classroom. Um, and that's kind of the silver lining of the past couple of years yeah. is that families are paying more attention. They're pushing for things like transparency bills. Some states mm -hmm. they're, they're pushing for CRT bans, for example. But I think these top down solutions, although they might be a step in the right direction towards achieving that group of parents goals, I think the better solution is from the bottom up, allowing for school choice, allowing each individual family to take mm -hmm. their children's education dollars to the education provider of their choosing, whether it's a public, private, charter, or home-based education option. That's the only way forward through freedom rather than force. Right. And especially because like a CRT ban, for example, even if your sole goal is to get rid of CRT in the classroom, it doesn't even achieve it. We now have a lot of undercover journalism from accuracy and media, for example, they've gone to states like Tennessee, Idaho, and Iowa, states that have CRT bans. Right. Where These the administrators, are not left-wing bastards. No. Yeah. They have yeah. CRT bans and they have administrators on camera admitting that we're just going to call it something else. We'll call it mm -hmm. social emotional learning, or right. maybe we'll just call it student mental health. And by the way, uh, there's a very low likelihood of any, of any of us being caught for doing these things. Mm -hmm. And we can always just weasel our way out of it. Um, so the better solution is to just give the money to the families mm -hmm. and then you don't have to force schools to do anything and you'll have an organic competitive response. Right. And I think uh, schools would just have an incentive to focus more on the basics going forward if there was school choice, because you don't want to upset your customers, whether that's on, on the left or the right. And so it'd be in their best interest to focus on education as opposed to so political, political that, I, You know, obviously, I agree with you. Reason agrees with you. I think, uh, you know, all libertarians agree to the extent that they'll even say, okay, the state should have a role in education. It should, you know, it should facilitate individual choice in education. Is there, you know, is there good data that the public is there or are they more like, I don't know anything about education, but I want my kid to come out smarter and you know, uh, you know, being able to read, write and do math. I don't care how you do it, but just do it. I mean, is school choice, you know, post pandemic, post shutdown, are people embracing that affirmatively? Yes. The latest nationwide polling from Real Clear Opinion Research has found an eight percentage point jump in support of school choice since April of 2020, where it was 64 percent support in April 2020. The latest polling was from February 2022, showing 72 percent of Americans supporting the concept of the money following the child or school mm -hmm. choice to a public private charter. Does or it have to get to I mean, you know, those are huge numbers and any politician, anybody anywhere would take those numbers. But with education, is it something like where it's really got to be about 90 percent? Because it's true, most students, but, you know, like 90 percent of students basically still go to traditional assignment, yep. you know, residential assignment schools. And when you look at parental satisfaction of people who have kids in school, mm -hmm. they're like, eh, you know what, like two thirds or higher. Are like, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. But at the same time, there's tons of polling that has come out showing that, you know, about 82 percent of 
families have kids in government run schools, but then you ask them, well, if money weren't an issue or if the yeah. money followed the child, where would you like to send your school kid to, kid to school? And it's typically less than half of that amount, about 30 to 40 percent mm -hmm. say that they would like their kids in the, their residentially assigned government run school. So I don't think people are as happy as what some polls would indicate just based on their preferences um, on, on, on these other surveys. And um, I, I, I unfortunately think it's not only about logic. I mean, we have the logical arguments. Uh, down uh, against the ed uh, the education establishment. The teachers unions don't have any good arguments. They just repeat the same thing over and over again. You're stealing our money. They're just trying to protect their monopoly. The, right. the, the, government, the, the money doesn't belong to the government schools. The education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting a particular institution. And by the way, if you're doing a good job, why would you lose any money right. at all? It has more to do with power dynamics, I think, is, is the problem, is that people from... Democrats, Republicans, independents, they have their super majority support on this real clear opinion research polling. Over 66% in each uh, category, Republican, Democrat, and independent supporting uh, school choice. So, and by that, I think that's you're when you say school choice, you're talking about money following the kid. Yep, to yep. public, private, right. or homeschool. Right. And we have super high levels of support, but the thing is, we have a special interest that fights mm -hmm. tooth and nail to keep the status quo and to fight against any um, notion of, of the families having more of a say. And they know their, how to wait, I mean, they know how to wait it out, right? Because they've, they've been doing this their whole life. I always think about it like I've bought maybe, you know, four or five cars in my lifetime, but I'm always going to a, a car salesman who sells like, you know, 20 or, you know, 10 cars a day. Like I'm, I'm a sucker. I'm never going to be able to to get the best deal. So the teachers unions have been really successful at mobilizing their numbers. They have a vested interest, and I think that's why they've been able to block school choice for so long. But the power dynamics have shifted over the past couple of years because families aren't just thinking about supporting change mm -hmm. in the education system. They're actually mobilized to do so, and they're mm -hmm. banding together. They're creating parent organizations, and they're pushing for change. Mm -hmm. So in a way, uh, for far too long, the teachers unions have essentially been the only special interest group when it comes to K-12 education. Right. They've been able to get what they want. But now there's a new special interest group in town, which happens to be parents who want more of a say in their kids' education. And they're not going to unsee what they saw in 2020. Mm -hmm. And they've become this new vested interest that's pushing for change. And I think that's why we've seen so much victory over the past couple of years. In 2021, we we're calling it the year of school choice because 19 states expanded or enacted programs to fund students as opposed to systems. That's a huge monumental win uh, nationwide for school choice. And we had the, the number of states with education savings accounts, which mm -hmm. is essentially the money goes, if you wanna take it to the government school, you can, but if not, the funding would follow the child to an education savings account directed by the parents, which you could use for private school tuition and fees, kind of like a voucher mechanism. We could also use it for micro schools or pandemic right. pods, any, tutoring, pretty any much approved. anything you want. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So the, the number of those states doubled from five states to 10 states yeah. in 2021. And the wins aren't aren't stopping there. Yeah. Let's let's talk about, uh, you know, the biggest win probably in school choice history, which is in Arizona, yeah. which has uh, been a leader in charter schools and things like that. What happened in Arizona? Yeah, so Arizona just passed a, the, the first state with an, a universal education savings account. Every single family, regardless of income, will be able to take their children's state-funded, taxpayer-funded education dollars to the education provider of their choosing. Okay. How much is that? It's about $7,000 per student, which is about half of what they spend in the government-run mm -hmm. schools. So the public schools actually get to keep the local and the federal funding. Mm -hmm. And so on a per-pupil basis, they end up with actually more money. I mean, just imagine if you stop shopping at... Safeway and started shopping at Trader Joe's and Safeway mm -hmm. got to keep half of your grocery bill right. or funding in, right. in perpetuity. It'd be a good deal for them. I'd argue this is actually a good deal for the public schools and the families at right. the same time. But, uh, but they, yeah, it's but about, they recognize that if there's a, uh, you know, if there is a bunch of students leaving eventually, you know, the, the you know, that money's going to run out. But so uh, right now, then, when does this start that Arizona students uh, and K through 12 parents will basically have seven thousand dollars that they can direct to do whatever they want with their kids education? Yeah. And I'll just reiterate this win is the biggest school choice victory in U.S. history. When does it kick into, uh, it, you know, when does it, is, it does it start in the fall or when does it start? It should start, um, I believe, next year sometime. Yeah. It's not immediately, but I think yeah. families can start signing up uh, this fall.
What, how does that, you know, $7,000 is a lot of money. Um, it, does that cover, you know, say with like parochial schools, you know, Catholic schools or, you know, private schools, that, will that cover all or most of tuition for the average private school? Yeah, so in Arizona, that is uh, about the median tuition in, of private schools. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be enough to cover the, the top, pri the, yeah, the yeah, highest yeah. The um, elite cost private schools private and school, all that private kind of schools. Stuff, yeah. But, you know, some options is better than not, none. Right. And this is, this is pretty good. Um, the teacher unions might come back and say, oh, well, you know, this isn't enough to afford the $20,000 private school. So um, this isn't actually school choice, they'll say. Right. But then I'll respond by saying, well, do you want the full amount of money to follow the child? Yep. Do you want the local funding mm -hmm. to follow as well, the 14 or so thousand? And then they'll say, oh, no, we don't want that. Then you're defunding the public schools. Well, that's your real argument. It's not about. Yeah. Um, and yeah. this will allow, this also can go to charter schools and mm -hmm. things like that. Yep. Um, you know, one of the uh, Kind of critiques of what happened during COVID was that there was suddenly the surge in demand for school choice for alternatives because people were like, mm -hmm. you know, my traditional residential assignment public school shut down or is shutting down and opening up or just doing bullshit. But one of the critiques that I've heard, which seems pretty on point, was that there was not a supply of, um, you know, alternatives. So it's mm -hmm. like parents were willing, but there was nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, is there, you know, how long will it take in Arizona for that supply of alternatives to traditional mm -hmm. public schools? How long will it take for that to ramp up? Yeah, I'd say it's a good uh, problem to have and it's better than the status quo, obviously. Sure. But it, it is a good reason to have education savings accounts because with the voucher mechanism, for example, which is a step in the mm -hmm. right direction, you have to use it at a private school, mm -hmm. which has large fixed costs. And if there's not enough supply there, um, you might have to build another school, which could mm -hmm. take a while. But with education savings accounts, you could use it for private school tuition and fees, but you could also use it for these lower cost startups like a micro school or pandemic pod where you don't have to build another brick and mortar school. Mm -hmm. You can use it for virtual learning. Um, uh, so nobody knows how long it'll take, but there, there is some excess capacity mm -hmm. uh, in, in each state. And then also there's already a, a micro school group that's been been accepting ESA funding mm -hmm. for for a while called Prenda Micro Schools in Arizona, and uh, they've been successful. So I think there's uh, when the demand's there, the supply will come. When you can when you mm -hmm. put the funding in the hands of the right. in the hands of enough families, well, then you're going to have operators coming in to to provide the right. the, the the services. So in a way, I mean, it's kind of like you know, pan, uh, COVID testing sites, like there were literally zero before, you know, January of 2020. And then suddenly they were all over the place. Schools are, you know, arguably more consequential, but supply can, can expand pretty quickly. Yeah. And we don't know how many people are going to use the program, mm -hmm. for example. So like a, a lot of people do like their public schools. Right. So um, there's high transaction costs associated with switching schools. Yep. So if you're, if you're in a school that's working for you, then, then you can stay. And, and um, we don't know how much of a max ex exodus this will be. Mm -hmm. And even if the polling I cited earlier where half of the people would rather yep. send their kids to private school rather than the government-run school, who, we don't know if that's going to happen immediately. People right. start to think about things yep. and then um, Do you it might think take some it will time. Have it? I'm thinking back to uh, work. This has got to be almost... 25 years old uh, by Carolyn, Carolyn Hoxby, um, who also showed that, you know, the threat of competition, or she looked at um, mm -hmm. urban school districts that had Catholic schools in them, you know, and the threat of losing students to a, an alternative up the game of the existing public schools. Yeah, there's actually now 28 studies that uh, look at the competitive effects of private school mm -hmm. choice initiatives. And 25 of the 28 studies find statistically significant positive effects of mm -hmm. private school choice competition on the student outcomes in the public schools. Right. So school choice is a rising so tide. So the right or the, the fear of exit actually, uh, you know, not surprisingly, it makes people up their game, right? Yep. And we saw this with COVID as well. There's a study by Michael Hartney and Leslie Finger. It's now peer reviewed. I don't remember the name of the journal, but they found that that public schools in places that had more Catholic schools nearby, which right. happened to be lower cost right. private schools, they were more likely to reopen their schools in person, the public schools. Right. And the theory there is that there's a competitive pressure. If families have a low cost exit option in the yeah. area, the public schools might have to say, oh, well, maybe we should open too yeah. so we don't lose enrollment. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the politics in Arizona. Arizona, you know, is a, you know, uh, helps define what conservative means in American politics. 
Uh, the Republicans, there's a Republican governor and a Republican, a ver- the slimmest of Republican majorities in the legislature there. How did that play out and why is that important in discussions of school choice? Yeah, so Arizona House and Senate each have a one seat majority. And so every single Republican had to show up on the day of the vote and vote for it. They, they had to, you had to have 51% of the chamber, not just 51% of those present and voting. Right. So literally they all had to be there, show up, vote for the expansion of school choice, which is a Republican Party platform issue. You would think it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, right. It's that hard to do in a state that you have a majority in each of the chambers mm-hmm. and the, the, the governor's office. And actually last year, they tried to do something similar. They were going to expand it, not as much, but it was going to be from like 20% of the population to like 70 or 80% of the population, as opposed to what they did this year, which was 100%. Mm-hmm. And that, with that bill last year, they passed it through the Senate, all Republicans in favor, all Democrats opposed. And then it got to the House and there were three Republicans that, who joined the Democrats to kill it last year. Mm-hmm. And there was backlash after, after that for them, one, going against their party platform and coming out, coming out against parental rights and education after two years of school closures. You had the teachers union groups out there sending fake obituaries to the governor for mm-hmm. reopening schools. And actually, one of those three Republicans who originally voted for the against the expansion to, to kill it last year actually co-sponsored the bill this year. So the winds had the political winds have changed in right. Arizona and nationwide. And I think some politicians are starting to realize that it could be a form of political suicide at this moment to come out against parental rights and education, particularly as a Republican. We've seen a lot of success with um, uh, elections when it comes to school choice, for example, in Iowa. Uh, Governor Reynolds is a huge supporter of parental rights and, and educational freedom, particularly with she had an education savings account bill last year, passed the Senate with all Republicans in favor except for one. And then it could not pass the House, even though the Iowa House had 60 percent uh, of the House were re- Republicans. Mm. And so she went out and endorsed nine candidates in most of those races. A clear dividing line was whether they supported school choice or not in the primaries. Eight of those nine candidates won. So school choice is a political winner yeah. as well. And um, it shouldn't have to come to that for, right. for an election. Uh, but I think politicians like we saw in Arizona can change their mind mm-hmm. and listen to parent concerns. But not in Texas, yeah, right? Which is another Republican state or, you know, it, it, it's run by the Republicans. Talk about how Texas and Oklahoma as well are states which you would think would be you know, either following Arizona's lead or leading in this type of issue. But Texas is yeah. kind of bad on school choice. So Texas has had a trifecta of Republican leadership in the you know, House, Senate right. and the governor's office for about two decades now. And they don't have any private school choice programs. They have charter schools, which is a great form of school choice. Right. But it's not what I would call funding students as opposed to systems with mm-hmm. an education savings account where, where the funding following the child to the, right. the private school as well. And they don't have any of those such programs. And in 2017, there actually was a big push to do a universal education savings account in Texas. It actually passed the Senate with all but two Republicans voting in favor. Mm -hmm. I think it was like, I don't want to come up with the numbers off the top of my head, but I think it was like 19 to 12 or Mm -hmm. they they passed it pretty easily in the Texas Senate. And then it didn't even get a a House vote. They didn't have the, the votes in the House even though Texas is what, 58% or so Republican in, in, in the House. And um, it kind of stalled there. And there, it kind of simmered out in 2017. There wasn't really national attention. What, but if yeah. that were to happen this year, the whole conversation has changed. I mean, you look at Texas Republican primary polling, for example, in 2018, they put in the Republican primary a question about school choice, and it was about 79% support, which it was, was good back then too. But then in this latest March primary in 2022 in Texas, 88% of Republicans said that they supported school choice, about a nine percentage point jump in support in just a few years. So the political winds have shifted in in Texas, but then nationally as well. If the Texas Senate were to pass a school choice bill, there would be all eyes nationally on what's happening in the Texas House, unlike what happened in 2017. Um, This has become more of a front and center issue nationally. It's become more clearly a Republican Party platform issue as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think there are the, the pressure to support parental rights right now for Republicans is higher than it's ever been before. But 
you know, they don't necessarily have a bill on the front burner, which seems kind of strange because <clears throat> people like Greg Abbott and, you know, Texas Republicans, you know, they, they talk a lot about grooming, you know, they're worried about kids, all of this kind of stuff. But why, you know, what is it about a state like Texas, which, you know, again, pride, you know, certainly Republicans in Texas pride themselves on being, you know, individualists mm-hmm. and small government people, but they're not delivering on school choice. So I think in some deep red states, the teachers unions know that they have to play in, in the Republican primaries. Mm-hmm. And they, so they have to get someone who is Republican on everything else, but on education, they're going to protect the status quo. So you have the, the teachers union. Yeah, Randy Weingarten's AFT has a chapter there in mm-hmm. Texas who play heavily in Republican primaries, particularly mm-hmm. in the House. They know that they just have to get one chamber. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's, I think, what they've done in Texas. We had the Senate votes. We didn't have the House votes. Mm -hmm. The union did a lot of endorsements this past uh, cycle as well in in the primaries um, for Republicans who weren't weren't in support of school choice, obviously. Um, Abbott, though, this year just gave his most forceful uh, support of school choice that that I've ever seen, where Mm -hmm. he said very clearly at an event, uh, I believe in May of 2022, uh, pretty recently, that he wants to push for school choice this year with the funding following the child to a public charter or private school, mm-hmm. not just public school choice, but all types of school choice. So that that shows that something has changed in Texas as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah. There's, there's not a bill right now, right. but also the session hasn't started. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking, I think... Um, it's not until January of 2023 right, when we'll be Texas, looking. Texas, the legislature only meets every other year. Yeah, right? exactly. So I think there's going to be a push and we'll see how that goes. And, um, uh, to talk about on a, a broader national level, there was a uh, Supreme Court decision coming out of Maine that, yeah. you know, augurs for a different, uh, you know, a kind of different legal framework for school choice. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we knew a long, for a long time now, ever since the Zelman v. Simmons-Harris case in, 2020, in 2002, for example, it was about an Ohio voucher program that basically said that such a program did not violate the Establishment Clause. Right. There was no separation of church and, and state. And this is issue. that a publicly funded voucher program yeah, publicly can funded. go to mm-hmm. private schools, go to religious schools, private schools, yep. public schools, whatever. Yep. The argument from the other side is that this is the government... Um, funding using public dollars to go to private religious institutions. Mm-hmm. This must therefore be a separation of church and state issue, mm-hmm. which one, the, the words separation of church and state are not found in the constitution. Right. This is not the government establishing a religion, but the, the, the reasoning of that case and the reasoning that makes sense to most people is the reason that K-12 education funding following the child is not a violation of the establishment clause for the same reason that Pell Grants are not violation right. a violation of the establishment clause. You can take your Pell Grant public funding to Notre Dame, a religious right. university. If you want to throw your dollars away, throw yeah. or actually throw my taxpayer <laughs> dollars away. My sister works at Notre Dame, so I'm but against it. The reasoning <clears throat> is the funding goes to the student yep. and then they have a choice between right. religious and non-religious and providers. And the primary function of the funding is not to support religion, but it's rather the, to facilitate right. some, you know, some other function for the, the and, person receiving it. And the same thing could be said for Head Start and other pre-K programs, mm-hmm. which can right. be used at religious pre-K right. providers. Yeah. Medicaid vouchers can be used at yeah. religiously affiliated hospitals. Mm-hmm. Uh, the list goes on and on. And nobody ever has an issue at any so of these other programs. What, what was the program at, in Maine that you know yep. so, r- resulted in a decision saying, yeah, you know what, this you know yep. uh, voucher money can be used anywhere? So after Zelman v. Simmons-Harris, I'm, I'm going to get to Maine in yeah. a second, there was the Espinoza, the Espinoza v. Mm-hmm. Montana decision. They had a tax credit scholarship form of private school mm-hmm. choice out there. And what they ruled in that, ca- in that case was that you don't have to have a school choice program. We're not going to say that all states have to have school mm-hmm. choice. But if you're going to have one, you can't discriminate against religious families and schools. Right. That you, that you, you can't just um, only allow families to take the funding to a non-religious uh, uh, private school. The thing is, Maine had such a program called the town tuitioning program. When it first started in the late 1800s, mm-hmm. you could take the voucher if you didn't have a public school in your town. That's why it's called town tuitioning. Mm-hmm. You could take it to another public school in a nearby district, or you could take it to a religious or non-religious private school. In 1981, for some reason, they switched the law and it started excluding the religious schools. And so this program clearly was... Um, in violation of of the ruling mm-hmm. from Espinoza just a couple of years ago, the circuit judge in Maine 
twisted the argument to try to say, oh, well, this is actually okay even after Espinoza because they were ruling that you couldn't use the fund, that you couldn't discriminate against religious um, schools for being religious. But what we're doing in Maine is that we're discriminating against religious schools for doing religious things, which is a distinction without a difference. Right. It, part of what it means to be religious is to do religious things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they were doing in Maine. Uh, we kind of knew all along it was going to be a slam dunk case. It ended mm -hmm. up being 6-3. Um, and now, essentially, this deals another mortal blow to the discriminatory anti-Catholic right. Blaine amendments that are found in dozens of yeah. state constitutions. And it's ironic since Blaine was from Maine, so it's kind of comes full circle on a you know on a long-standing grudge against Catholic schools, basically in, in United States history. Yep, and this should only further embolden legislators and mm -hmm. families to push for school choice initiatives yeah. because they don't have to worry about the teachers' union argument having any credibility. It never had any credibility for the same reason. Um, their, their main arguments about the right. establishment clause, which was also mentioned right. in the Carson v. Macon case as well. But this, sh this should uh, only further mobilize right. families to push even harder. Who are the main constituents for school choice? Because, you know, it seems like when we, when we talk about red states, um, a lot of the rhetoric seems to be coming from uh, families, you know, that they are white Christian families that are talking about things like parental rights and they want either religious freedom or they want to remove their kids from places where they're being taught CRT or they're being taught some kind of secular humanism. That seems to be a lot of the rhetoric. You know, how big a part of the school choice movement is that? And then you know, back in the day, when you look at people, you know, like early on, people like Milton Friedman, who, you know, created the kind of modern concept of vouchers in the 50s, a lot of his energy was focused on minority mm -hmm. families, you know, black, Latino and lower class, like lower income families being freed from schools that were plainly not going to do anything mm -hmm. for them. Um, talk a little bit about the, the breakdown of constituents and where is the growth in the in the um, hunger for school choice? Yeah, I think it's all across the board. I mean, you hear rhetoric from from certain states about certain groups, but if you look at who participates in private school choice programs and with charter schools nationwide, uh, the students in charter schools are more likely to be non-white than government-run mm -hmm. schools, and they're more likely to be from lower-income families than students in government-run schools, according to National Center for Education Statistics right. data nationwide. Uh, and then also with private school choice programs, like I, I'm from D.C., we have the D.C. voucher program, mm -hmm. And uh, it's targeted to low-income families. I believe the average household income is less than $30,000 a year in the district. And I want to say the latest numbers suggest that 95% of the students are either Black or Hispanic using mm -hmm. the program uh, in D.C. Uh, there's data from other states mm -hmm. showing similar uh, patterns in Florida, for example, they have the tax credit scholarship program. Over 100,000 students are using scholarships to go to private schools, which I think is another reason why DeSantis won the 2018 gubernatorial mm -hmm. election, as written in a Wall Street Journal uh, opinion piece called uh, Making the Case that School Choice Moms mm -hmm. uh, won the governor's race for DeSantis. He won by slim mar margins, and his opponent, Andrew Gillum, mm -hmm. uh, had come out in support of getting rid of those scholarships for, for families. And so uh, Ron DeSantis overperformed with school choice moms as, as a demographic, mm -hmm. uh, which led to that Wall Street Journal article. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now I th you, know, you, you hear the arguments being, being laid out, but the reality is school choice can benefit people from all different types Certainly. of backgrounds. And if you want to take your voucher to a school that has social emotional learning or whatever you want to call it, um, even if yeah. I don't agree with it or someone else doesn't agree with that as, as, as uh, what should be taught in schools, it's better than forcing everybody to be in a system right. where everybody has to learn something that they don't want their kids to learn. So, so this is really the only way forward to align families' values with their education yeah. providers uh, and, and those institutions. But does it, you know, given the fact that, um, you know, lower income voters, black voters, Hispanic voters, you know, overwhelmingly vote Democratic, if school choice is seen as a fundamentally Republican issue, um, you know, does that, you know, does that cause difficulty in actually selling school choice universally? It could, but at, uh, at the same time, I think a path to bipartisanship or nonpartisanship could be through partisanship. Whether we like it or not, what we're seeing right now is that Republicans are more likely to vote in support of school sure. choice. It's on their party platform. The victories we saw in right. 2021 with the 19 states 
Some were bluer states, Illinois, mm -hmm. for example, saved their program, um, but most of them were red states. Uh, but what I think happens, I mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. is that a lot of this is about uh, political power dynamics more than logic. I mean, the logic is clear that it should be a nonpartisan issue. And if you pull mm -hmm. the constituents themselves, it's a nonpartisan right. issue. Um, if Republicans lean into educational freedom and, and the funding following the child, like uh, we saw this happen in, in Virginia with Terry, Terry McAuliffe saying, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they, right. they should teach. And instead of backpedaling, he quadrupled down and had Randy right, Weingarten right. stump inform the night before the election. I think everybody kind of agrees that didn't work out really well for, for him. Yeah. Um, if Republicans can start to lean into this as an issue and win on it, like we saw with Randy Weingarten's own poll in the battleground mm -hmm. states, the yeah. Republicans are winning on education according to the union's own poll. Democrats might have to scratch their heads a little bit and say, well, maybe we should do this too. Right. And so you could create nonpartisanship through partisanship as a result of changing mm -hmm. political power dynamics. So let's talk a little bit about Ron DeSantis in Florida. And, you know, going back to Jeb Bush, Florida was always considered a good education state or a good state for education choice and things mm -hmm. like that. And DeSantis, on the one hand, seems to be a proponent of school choice. And then on the other, he is a culture warrior who is constantly railing against left wing indoctrination. He you know, is an anti CRT guy. He wants mm -hmm. things, you know, what the broad parameters of what is allowable to teach. He wants to decide that and Florida Republicans at the state level, which seems to be counter, you know, mm -hmm. contradictory to the idea of no, let's give let's let education dollars follow the students, but we don't want wherever they end up to be able to stray too much from this thing. Uh, can you talk about that? Is 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 that a misreading of DeSantis or or kind of Florida Republicans, mm -hmm. or do they need to change the way that they're talking about education reform? I think the argument is that if we're going to have a top down system mm -hmm. of state control of education mm -hmm. or or through the school boards. The left is pushing their political agendas into the school, so right. the right counters that with also with a top-down approach mm -hmm. to put their political agendas into the schools or to take away the left's political right. ag agendas that are already in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the argument for why uh, it's it, it may be justified. But okay. again, after this Arizona victory with Doug Ducey, you know Arizona and Florida were neck and neck for a while. You know it was a toss-up. Who's the who's the number one school choice state? Right. People, you know. You, Depending on who you ask, some people would say Arizona, some people would say Florida. Mm -hmm. But now Arizona just cemented itself as number one. It, it, it's yeah. blowing out Florida in terms as uh, of the percentage of the population that's eligible. I think DeSantis should pull a power move and come back and say, OK, well, let's either call a special session or mm -hmm. next session we'll really get it together. And we're, we're going to go all in as well, because, look, we're already funding education for every single family. And every single family should have a choice. We shouldn't have these little mm -hmm. eligibility criteria. I will say, though, to, to Florida's credit, they did have a massive victory in 2021. They had their biggest expansion of school choice in Florida history in 2021, mm -hmm. a state that was already doing a good job right. on school choice. And they built in something called an, an automatic escalator, where each year the percentage of students eligible for the program, even without having to go back and vote on this again, it will uh, expand the eligibility. I think it's mm -hmm. by about 1% of this population will increase each year, but mm -hmm. that could take a while yep. um, to, to make it universal. Um, so I would argue they should just blow off the cap mm -hmm. as soon as possible, do what Arizona did and empower all families immediately. No one should have to wait any longer uh, to become eligible for their kids' education right. dollars. And at the same time, this should fix a lot of the CRT uh, whether you want to call it an issue or yeah. just a disagreement in the public schools, because again, I think competition will lead to more of a focus on the basics in the mm -hmm. public schools because you don't want to upset your customers. It just makes more sense to not alienate anybody. Um, but then at the, the same, same time, time if, you want to, yeah. if you want to specialize in that way yeah. and you want to build a market yeah. niche, you could do that too. Right. And we want, to, we want to be controlling what other people's kids learn. But maybe that's the problem, right? That people want to control what other people are learning and that it's more valuable kind of, you know, this, uh, some people talk about abortion politics like this, you know, the big problem with Dobbs is that it actually forces the sides to do something where it was much better to just be able to argue over this type of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. rather than actually have to do anything. And I wonder if education is kind of like that. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah, I think that could there could be some of that sentiment that some people do want to control what other people's right. kids are learning. But uh, 
just from a implementation standpoint, the the bills don't do that. They they don't actually um, stop things mm-hmm. from happening that are going to happen anyway. So yeah. I mean, we've seen these undercover videos. Yeah. That it's still being tied even when you have the bans. Yeah. And um, it's essentially unenforceable. And what I would say is it's, it's a form of playing whack-a-mole. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be a different battle in the schools, whether right. you know the CRT battles of today are the, the common core battles of yesterday. Right, and it's right. going to be or something back else Back in going the early forward. 60s, like <laughs> physical education stuff, because yeah. you know we were a nation of fat slobs who couldn't beat the Soviets, et cetera. So. Yeah, so it's always going to be something else. Yeah. And what are we going to do to like, keep passing different bills and trying yeah. to... Um, top-down manufacturer right. what the perfect school should look. We don't do that in any other industry, right? We let people yep. choose based on their preferences, and we don't really care all that much about controlling other people's uh, uh, um, choices yeah. when it comes to well, other things. So let me ask you a question because, you know, obviously I care a lot about school choice. I know, you know, reason the reason audience does, libertarians generally do. Um, but it's also true, like, for a lot of people, it's it's kind of like, the, you know, drug policy, people who are into it, it, it is absolutely important and it's central to everything that they do. With school choice, it's like that. But for most people, it isn't their top issue. Like, how do you make, you know, we live in a country where there are fewer kids, fewer households have kids or, you know, families have kids. And this is fundamentally about, you know, when it's your kid in the K through 12 system, you care a lot about it. I, you know, I have two sons who are now out of K through 12 education. And I have to admit, I'm kind of like, it's fucked up, but like, eh, it doesn't hurt me the same way. Like, how do you, how do you grow the urgency of school choice mm-hmm. for people who are not particularly invested in the topic? It's true that you're going to be more invested if your kid's currently in the system, mm-hmm. but at the same time, everybody's paying for it through the tax yeah, system, yeah. right? Through, mm-hmm. through uh, local property taxes, through state level taxes and yeah. from, for federal revenue. So everybody and has arguably invested. through, you know, shittier workers, right, who come out who don't know yep. how to read or write or, or, you know, do anything. Yeah. So having a well-educated populace can lead to benefits. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, um, yeah, that's that that's basically it. If, mm-hmm. if, if you think that kids are being indoctrinated in a way that disagrees with that you disagree with, mm-hmm. if you think that government schools are more likely to inculcate values of loving big government, as a libertarian, we have a very strong interest in uh, allowing for school choice to uh, uh, be, and then even if your number one policy issue isn't school choice, for example, mm-hmm. um, it's in your best interest to support it because this could lead to people vote, that those students growing up and voting for other policies that um, might align more with, with, with your values in the future. Um, so if we have more of a free market in education that could lead to more free market reforms mm-hmm. in other areas. Um, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's make a day to talk, you know, five years from now, what, what are the benchmarks, you know, that will show, you know, that, okay, that school choice is not simply on the horizon, but that we're living in a, in a world of school mm-hmm. choice. How, how do we, how do we mark success? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways. You can look at the number of states that have different types of school choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have a program or not? I mean, right now we have about 31 states, I want to say, that have some form of private school choice. Almost all states have charter school laws on the books. I want to say 47 of the states have charter school laws on the books. Uh, but then also, uh, almost more importantly, is how many people are eligible for such programs. So just because every state has a private school choice program, if only 1% of the population can actually use it, that's not very meaningful to me. Uh, what, what we're looking towards is like the Arizona victory. Uh, the gold standard is every single family regardless of background, is able to take their kids' education yep. dollars, public, private, charter, or homeschool. So uh, that's that's the way to measure, measure success. Is, mm-hmm. is it available to families? Other people might say, well, measuring success of school choice is to see if the program works, but uh, the program working is families using it and choosing a school and, and liking it for whatever reason that is. Um, a lot of people like to look at test scores. That's, that's part of the decision-making process for families, but we have values alignment that are important, safety, uh, and other issues that go into the decision uh, of choosing one school over the other. All right. We're going to leave it there. Corey DeAngelis, thanks so much for talking. Yeah, thank you.